Good morning. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise. Let's give the Lord our praise this morning. We're so glad to see you here. If you are visiting with us this morning, we would love to uh, have you fill out one of these connection cards in the bulletin and just put that in the offering plate later in our service and let us know a little bit more about you. And we're glad that you are here this morning. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to call attention to. Um, one is that we are continuing to receive our Annie Armstrong offering for North American missions this month. The goal is $5,000, and that it all goes to reaching North America for, uh, with the gospel of Christ. Also, if you have or know of any uh, high school or college graduates in our church family, please let me know about that, and we'll, we want to recognize them on May the 7th uh, as well. Also, um, just a, an additional word about VBS, if you can even come work one night or, or two nights of the week, let Caroline know. Let Caroline know because we'll take all comers, uh, whatever time you can give, we can use you because we're planning on covering this place up with kids. And so we need, uh, we need everybody, anybody, whenever you can come and help. So... Also, uh, so I want to call on Aslan to come up and uh, make a... Oh, you want to show the video for him? Boy, come on up while they show it. He's got a video he wants to show, then he wants to tell you something.
Uh, we're looking forward to that. A bunch of churches in the area put this on every year, and uh, we're able to go uh, this summer. So if you know or have any students grades 6 through 12, uh, please let me know and tell me. Um, it's going to be a great time, as you can see, tons of other churches and tons of other students there, tons of games, and of course, a ton of worship. It's going to be a great week, and I'm genuinely looking forward to it. So I uh, wanted to uh, make sure everybody is aware of that coming up and just give you a few ways you can help. Uh, first way, uh, if you're able to take a week off this summer and come chaperone with us and take some time off to invest not only in our students, but invest in other kids and other students that will be there, uh, please do. The only thing that we're required to bring is chaperone. Sounds like something you could be interested in and helping us out with and helping our student ministry out with. Please let me know. Again, it will be a great week. Second way you can help, uh, May 21st, I believe we'll be having an after church luncheon. Um, not only for this, but it will also be a lunch to celebrate uh, Brother Marcus and his time here. Um, so put that on your schedule to come by and to make sure to grab a plate to eat after lunch. If anybody has any other questions or anything else they want to ask me about or sign a student up, please come see me. I'm uh, looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Riley. celebrate the fact that our God is a God.
Mr. Crow, the day had come, the soldiers with the blessed sun, they thrust a crown of thorns upon our Savior, nailed him to a wooden cross, they thrust in their spear and cast their but with his death we must sing hallelujah, 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 have all fled the tomb, the Son of God could not be held inside it. The women came, they saw the stone was rolled away, where did he go? We want to see him and sing hallelujah. and Lamb, the Lord Jesus, the one in whom we place our trust, to him we must all sing hallelujah. He raised our sin and cleansed our stains, now we must all join the refrain and praise the glorious Lamb, sing hallelujah. Dealing with things as, as life goes on, uh, we, we just come off a big Easter celebration, and, or maybe you can remember going back in your younger days, going to camp, and you come back and you're fired up, and then it kind of wanes away, and uh, coming from a uh, coaching background, it's okay during the season, because you've got the next day or the next week to, to, to overcome whatever happened after that, but then once the season ends, it's just kind of over, and then what do you do at that point? So I like to talk about once a year about a topic nobody wants to really talk about, but studies show that Americans are going through this all the time. Um, most of those people around here right now that are in this room that are going through this that you may not know about because you just don't want to talk about it because it is such a hard topic. COVID really hammered America with this and other places because it isolated so many people. One of the biggest things you can't do when you're depressed is be isolated, get yourself away from other people. So let's begin this morning talking about this topic of depression. Sometimes we call it having the blues or being down. And for most people, it's just a season in your life. You go through it, and maybe it's after the death of a loved one. Maybe something happens financially. Maybe you have to change jobs, but you end up bouncing back and everything, everything gets back to normal. But what happens when you can't shake it? 
what do we do when we just feel low all the time? I mean, I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to be happy. This is not supposed to be what I'm going through. I'm not supposed to be down, and I'm not supposed to be sad. I don't understand this. Lord, help me. Help me feel joy again. When I think about the strong men of God, the real heroes of the faith, very often we don't talk about their human side. We kind of skip through it. Or the Bible is so many times so matter of fact. It's like Jesus was scourged. Well, unless you do a background of what Roman scourging included, you might not think much about that. But when you realize what he went through, that was a big ordeal. And sometimes when the Bible talks about the heroes of the faith, when it hits some of their character flaws, it mentions them, but it doesn't go into great detail about them. I mean, think about Moses. What good can you not say about Moses? But at one point he asked and prayed, God, take my life. We know about the success Jonah had, one of the greatest ministries of all time, one of the greatest revivals of all time. And once it was over and the entire city comes to know Jesus, he prays, Lord, take my life. I'm miserable. We love to preach about the boldness of Jeremiah, but forget he was called the weeping prophet. He had he never, ever, ever had a convert. That doesn't play on today's television. Because if you're not producing numbers, you've got to be doing something wrong. And yet, he's in God's will, and yet he's weeping all the time over the sins of the people. And probably he gets a little bit discouraged because it's like nobody's listening to him. Nobody hears him. Nobody knows what's going on. Even Paul despaired even of life. At one time, false prophets was, after all, just a man. He's got to preach a revival. If you know the story, I'm not going to rehash it today, but he calls down fire from heaven after making a big scene of filling up water everywhere to show that after spending a day letting the false prophets call on their gods to light the fire and they couldn't get it done, Elijah does. After making fun of them, it's a great scene. He even asks them if their God, maybe he's in the bathroom. He, he ridicules them the whole time. And then God answers Elijah's prayer and he wipes out all of what you would think would be all of the corruption in Israel and it ought to be the greatest day of his life. But he was a human being. And he suffered discouragement, despondency, and depression. And on one particular, particular occasion, he couldn't shake it. No matter what he tried, he couldn't shake having the blues. For many years, he had stood strong against and amidst almost insurmountable odds and circumstances. But now, after the greatest victory of his life, He dropped into the throes of discouragement and despair. So this morning, if you're hurting, if you're depressed, if you're, if you're discouraged, don't give up. God still loves you, and God will restore the joy of your salvation. I'm glad this chapter is included in Scripture. I'm glad that all the chapters are included in Scripture that talk about our heroes with their warts and all. It's not just a book written that everything goes right all the time, and if you follow Jesus, nothing's ever going to go wrong. That's just not the case. Bad things do happen. It doesn't ignore their weaknesses. Let's begin in 19, uh, 1 Kings 19, verse 1. Now, Ahab, this is after the entire event of him calling down fire from heaven and wiping out all of Jezebel's prophets. So Ahab, the whipped husband that he was, ran home and told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and had killed all the prophets with the sword. Now, Ahab, we're looking at him. We look at a weak leader, kind of a worm, a weak husband, a coward. Guy to stab you in the back. And then there's Jezebel, the domineering wife, the evil monarch. And she sends a message to our hero Elijah that says, basically, tomorrow you're going to be dead. And this is after he had watched God bring down fire and wipe out a thousand false prophets. Or then, and then had the prophets wiped out a great victory. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Well, look who's, who she is threatening. This is Elijah, man of heroism, heroism, the prophet of God, the hero of faith, who has faced down all the evil in the land and won. It's a great day of victory. It's a great celebration. Everything is going right. He is the national champion. He has won the Super Bowl. He has done it all. She 
surely he would never fall for this wicked woman's intimidation. Verse 3 says that he was afraid. After all of that, all of his career, everything he had seen God do, all the miracles, he's afraid. And ran for his life. Came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. He said, it is enough. I've had enough. I can't, I, I just, I can't take, I, I can't take, I've had enough. Lord, take my life. I'm not better than anybody else. It came before me, that's alive now, that's coming. I'm done. But when you leave Beersheba, you leave Israel. So he leaves his hometown. He's going to travel 80 miles on foot into Judah. He's scared. He's alone. He's depressed. He's asking for death. The question is why? Why did he run from Jezebel after what had just taken part at Mount Carmel? Now, just plainly speaking, as someone who's preached for a long time, here's what I kind of think may have happened. It's the revival. And it's the last night of the revival. And the Spirit of God falls. And you see many people come to Jesus. And you think, man, this is it. This is awesome. This is everything. God is about to move in this church. This church is going to change the community. And then comes Monday. And the first call you get. Well, that lasted too long last night. You can't, we can't, that service went too long. You can't have an invitation that long. I know I'm being a little ludicrous, but it's just things like that happen. And you think as a preacher, man, hey, I, I've done everything I know to do. God moved. Everybody in the community is going to change. Everybody's going to be happy, and then nobody is. And you're like, oh, what am I going to do? And you got to think with Elijah, he goes out there and embarrasses all the gods that the, that the Israelites were, were worshiping, those false gods. He embarrasses them. He shows they don't exist. He demonstrates the power of God, or God demonstrates his power through Elijah. And Elijah's got to be thinking, it's all about to change. We're about to see a kingdom come to God. We're about to see a, 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 an evil king and queen turn their backs on Baal and follow God. Everything is about to change. This was great. It's the greatest sermon I've ever preached. It's the greatest movement of God I've ever seen. And everybody is going to get on board and change. Instead, she says in 24 hours, I'm going to kill you. So that extreme high that he was on, the message he gets in 24 hours, I'm going to kill you. Didn't they see God's power? Why can't they get along with one another? Why can't they forgive one another? Why can't they catch on fire for God in this community? What, what am I doing wrong? Elijah forgets that people reject God despite the evidence, not because of the evidence. So why did Elijah flee? First, Elijah wasn't thinking clearly or realistically. So when you start falling toward the end of those steps of depression, probably the first step you're, you're going through is you're not thinking clearly or you're having unrealistic expectations on your life. Again, it's that... It's that social media mentality. We look at it day after day after day after day, and everybody's life is awesome except mine. Everybody's life is great except mine. Look at all the postings and all the pictures, and everything's great, and everybody's on the beach, and everybody's team wins, and everybody's kid hits a bomb, and uh, just it's all perfect. See, God hadn't done things Elijah's way. Elijah got down. Then instead of turning to God in prayer, disappointment made Jezebel seem to be bigger than what she was. 
when he kind of thinks, God, this didn't happen like it should have happened, and I don't know what you're doing now, and now look what now it's only made Jezebel matter, and now she's going to kill me. And we kind of forget. We get our eyes off of God. We get our eyes off of what he's done, and we start focusing on our problems. And our problems get bigger, and they get bigger, and they get bigger until we're overwhelmed by our problems, and Elijah's overwhelmed here. He's taking his eyes off God. We let our prayer life slide. Then the devil seems to grow stronger and stronger and stronger. So one, he wasn't thinking clearly. Then second, he separates himself from the people that he needed the most. The Bible says he left his servant. Took his servant part of the way, then left him. So now Elijah's alone. Worst place you can be. That's what COVID taught us. The worst place you can be is alone. We were created to have a relationship with other people brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're isolated from that, we get down. That's why it's so important, and it's one of the things I hate I was unable to do, just because I'm, I'm part-time, is, is that when people are sick or people in the hospital or people are locked in at home, we need to go see them. We need to make an effort to go see them, and I know there's been guys here that have done a great job of doing that. But discouraged people are lonely people. He should have stayed with friends. He should have been with godly men and women who would have prayed for him and encouraged him. But human nature is repetitive. When we get discouraged, the first thing we do is get alone. And that's the worst thing we can do. So he's not thinking clearly. He separates himself. And then third, he's caught in the backwash of a great victory. I promise you that some of the lowest times that you'll ever face will come after an emotionally spent, when you're emotionally spent over a giant victory. That's when the devil comes after you because you put everything into whatever it is that's going through and hopefully it's a win and then Satan starts coming after you because you're probably a little bit tired. I don't do it, obviously, you can tell by the disease, but I've read about rock climbers or mountain climbers. They, they say that climbing to the peak is often grueling, exhausting experience, but the anticipation, the idea that I'm going to get to the top of Mount Everest, or I'm going to get to the top of whatever mountain I'm climbing, it keeps me going, it keeps me going, it gives me determination, and it heightens our motivation. Then you arrive, and then words can't describe the view you see from on top of the mountain. But then you got to come down, don't you? You can't just hang out up there because, number one, you're going to die from lack of oxygen. But you just can't stay up there. You can't stay on the mountaintop all the time. And that descent is where we can get into a little bit of trouble. That's where it gets really dangerous because you're not as heightened as you were before. You're not watching every step you make as you get on the way up. You're just trying to get down. And you don't see the snares that are there. You don't see the traps that are there. We begin to stumble, we begin to fall. Now let's use this scenario, an analogy spiritually. The big battle on Carmel was past. The great victory was a memory. His energy and emotions had peaked and begun to slide. And the people didn't change. They just knew they were going to change, but they did. At least everything that he perceived that were going to change, these changes hadn't taken place. So we move into our fourth move. He's exhausted. He's exhausted. He's emotionally spent. You know, God put the Sabbath day in there for a reason. You know, granted, he did say we're to work six and rest seven, and we tend to go five and two. That's okay. But sometimes our two are working just as hard as the five we had just had. We've got to clean up the entire house and yard, and we got to do it now. There goes my Saturday, Sunday. I'm tired. I'm going to get up and go to church. It's a good thing. We get here, then all we, 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 get, we get better, and then maybe we should go home and, you know, watch golf because nothing will put you to sleep faster than watching golf on TV. But uh, we end up finding out something else to do. And before we know, we're back. We're back going Monday, and we really haven't had any downtime. We haven't had any rest time to catch up with our emotions. And for years, Elijah lived on the edge. He was a wanted and hunted man. He was always wanted and hunted by Jezebel and Ahab. 
He was public enemy number one, and this guy was spent after years of fighting, living in the wilderness, life on the run, and caught up with him, and he was exhausted and vulnerable to the power of depression. There's no Greek saying, and I want you to really understand this, you will break a bow if it is always bent. You will break a bow if you keep it always bent. It's got to be the break time. It's got to be some downtime. go down this road too far but in a little bit. Some of our work ethics nowadays are way too much downtime, but that's just the, the new, what I'm reading about some of the new people coming into the workforce. But for most of us that are here today, you don't know that. You stay busy. You stay at work. You keep going. If you're constantly living under stress, you'll finally break. Got to have some time for rest and refreshment. I've seen evidence in my own life and the lives of my minister of, of people that I work with. I used to talk about, you know, um, a lot of preachers take off on Monday because everything they do builds towards Sunday. And they're just exhausted come Monday. But now I think more in the lines of a, of a season. Like I can go through a season, a baseball season, as tired as I am right now. And as many games as we're going through, you, you get, you know, the next day you got a game, the next day you got a game. But five, in about four weeks from now, hopefully it's, we'll be holding the trophy in five weeks. The sixth week is, uh, what am I going to do with my life? I've been going since January 2nd or whatever and have not let up. Not let up. And now it's the end of May. Satan has a chance to come in and jump on me because I'm what I do in my life now. Eventually, things will pick back. Oh, Lord, help me! Football will be right there. But I mean, it's just it's um it, it, it's tough. Charles Haddon Spurgeon uh, once said, "Let no man who looks for ease of mind and seeks the quietude of a life enter the ministry. If he does so, he will flee from it in disgust." I don't know if Elijah was disgusted, but I can tell you he was exhausted. You can hear in his words. He said, it is enough now, Lord. Take my life, for I am not better than my father's. See, finally, Elijah fell into self-pity. It's a bad emotion. It will lie to you. It will exaggerate. It will drive you to tears. It will cultivate a victim mentality in your head. Way too many people fighting self pity out there. And in the worst case scenario, it can bring you to the point of wishing to die, which is exactly where Elijah was. He says, For I'm not better than my father's. Whoever, whoever told him he had to be better than somebody else, he was called to be him, not somebody else. He was called to do his job, not somebody else's job. And yet here he is. Uh, Comparing himself to other people, and there again, that's where we get into a bind. We don't need to compare ourselves to other people. We need to understand we're fearfully and wonderfully made, and we need to be planning and do what God wants us to do, not what God wants our neighbor to do. You've got a role. Everybody's got a role. From the custodian to the president of the United States, some God, you're just as important in God's eyes either way, and you've got a role to win people to Christ. Do your job. Be where you are. Don't keep thinking, I wish I was doing something else, or I wish this was better. Be where you are and let God lead you to be where you are. He's always said, if you're faithful in the small things, I'm going to give you bigger things to handle. Elijah told this mess to himself, and he opened the door for the pathetic liar, self-pity, when we establish an unrealistic standard we can't live up to. It mauls its way into our minds like a beast and claws us to shreds. Let God be your standard. He's always loving. He's always affirming. Always accepting. Always faithful. Holds us up. And it was the faithful Jehovah God who now stepped on the scene after Ahab, Jezebel, and Elijah had played their part in this drama. And speaking for the man who prayed to die and yet never did, never died, thank God for unanswered prayer. So here we go. 
5, he lay down and slept under a juniper tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked in hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in strength to the food of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. God met his servant Elijah in his greatest moment of desperation and despair. This is mercy at its best. It's beautifully portrayed by the masters himself. First of all, God allowed Elijah a time to rest. God allowed him a time to get his feet back underneath him. Then he come after him with a sermon. He took care of his physical needs first. That's take care of our bodies, folks. Got to exercise. Got to eat right. I'm not going to jump on you too much here, but you got to. One of the hardest times I've had going through what I've with my surgery is my exercise is, is not the most vigorous. I'm not going to lie to you, but I haven't been able to do it. The stress kind of piles up on me a little more. Things that don't normally bother me are like up to here with me right now. And I've got to walk kind of be patient about what I say before I, so I don't get in trouble. But we need that exercise. There's no sermon. There's no rebuke. There's no blame. There's no lightning bolt from heaven saying, look at you. Get up, you worthless ingrate. Instead, God says, take a break, relax, and eat. Exhaustion can make us turn cartwheels, and fatigue can lead to all kinds of strange imaginations. It'll make you believe a lie, and Elijah was believing in a lie, partly because he was exhausted, so God gave him rest. See, Elijah's biggest lie was, I'm all by myself. That was his lie. I'm all by myself. I preached that great sermon. Everybody should have turned. Nobody did. I'm it. Take me out. Obviously, this plan didn't work. So God gave him rest. And afterwards, Elijah went on a 40 days and 40 nights in the strength of it. And second, God communicated wisely to Elijah, like he will communicate to us. Verse 9 says that he came there to the cave and lodged there. And behold, behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? God didn't say you ought to be ashamed of yourself, young man. He didn't say snap out of it, son. Snap out of it. What you're feeling is not real. Snap out of it. No such thing as depression. You're stronger than that. What are you doing here? That's the question that was asked. What are you doing here? Maybe he's asking you that this morning. What are you doing here at this point in your life? Not that what you're doing is horribly wrong, but what are you doing here? What are you doing with your life? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, the sons of Israel. I have been doing God's work. Because the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And again, I alone am left. They seek my life to take it away. Elijah was believing the big lie. I'm alone and left. There's nobody else. There's no other believers. There's nobody that thinks like me. I'm the only voice of God left, and they're trying to kill me. God didn't say that's dumb, Elijah. That's a stupid thought to have, Elijah. Instead, God said, Elijah, get up. Get out of this cave. It's dark in here. It's dark in here. You need to get out into some light, son. Because nothing good's going to happen in this darkness. You've got to start getting your life moving on. Stand in the light. Stand on the mountain before me. That's where you're going to be encouraged. Forget about Jezebel for the moment. I want you to get your eyes on me. Quit looking at her. Look at me. I'm here for you, and I'll always be here for you. He's saying the same thing to each one of us this morning. Whatever you're going through, I promise there's someone in this church who has been there and has come through the other side. That's why Sunday school and small groups are so important. Verse 11 said, So he said, Go forth, stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. 
And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. We've got wind, we've got earthquake, we've got fire, one right after the other. And there stands Elijah in the middle of them, a stained old mantle wrapped around him waiting before God. But God was not in any of those mighty upheavals. And then just as you might expect from the God of all mercy, after the fire, the sound of a gentle blow. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle. See, we could see a lot of things. We could see God's power all over the place. But until we get still and listen, and listen, it's one of the problems we have in our prayer life. God, help me do this. God, forgive me of this. God, make me be more faithful. God, help me to take care of this. God, be with this family. Amen. Well, it's not a conversation. That's just you giving a list of demands. At some point, we've got to be silent before the Lord and listen for that small, still voice. It's dialogue between us and God. And this is what Elijah's about to have. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Then he said, I have been for a zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel. I've forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword, and I alone are left. They seek to take my life. The same lesson has to be learned over and over by us to repeat it, not by might, not by power, but my strength, saith the Lord. Sometimes it shows that, uh, I mean, just look. We're called to be witnesses. We're not called to change people. And just remember that. When you really spend a lot of time investing in somebody and they don't change, it's not your fault. Sometimes it's their fault. Sometimes you're just beginning the process of what God has set you there to, to plant the seed that somebody else is going to cultivate later on. But just because something doesn't happen immediately doesn't mean we've got to just shut it down. When we're in discouragement and despair, and, and despair is set in, humble yourself before God, and the Bible says, draw near to Him, and He'll draw near to you. One of my favorite verses, draw near to Him, and He'll draw near to you. And in verse 15, the Lord said to him, go return your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael king over Aram, and Jehu the son of Nimshi, you will anoint king over Israel. I got work for you to do, Elijah. Your job's not over. You only had part of your job, and it was a big one. It was awesome. But you got more work to do. Now that you've rested, and now that you're listening to me. Then it shall come about the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall put to death, and the one who escapes from the word sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. Yet I will leave. 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. I thought I was all alone. You know what Satan wants to do? When you're all alone, nobody's suffering like you. And then God's saying, Elijah, there's 7,000 guys like you. 7,000 out there. Need you to lead them. Now you know what it's like to hurt a little bit. Now you know what it's like when things don't go exactly your way. Now go be a leader. That's reassurance. It shows Elijah his quiet ministry over the years actually bore more fruit than he ever imagined. Yeah, he had the big event that didn't go exactly like he wanted, but yet God reminds him all the little things you were faithful in has led to 7,000 followers of Yahweh in the air. It's working, son. And then finally, God gives Elijah a close personal friend. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat. He was plowing with twelve pair of oxen before him, and and when and, and he with the twelve, and Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. 
He left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done for you or to you? So he returned from following him and took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh and the implements of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. Thanks to God's kind, gentle dealing, Elijah crawled out of the cave, and God sent a friend to stand by him. We're not designed to be hermits in a cave. We're designed to be people out in the world. We're to have fellowship. We're to have community. That's why the church, the body of Christ, is so important. This is where we join together in love and mutual encouragement. We're meant to be part of one another's lives. Otherwise, we pull back and we focus on ourselves, thinking of only our problem. Elijah had to get his eyes back on the Lord, not the earthquake, not the fire, even Mount Carmel, but on the Lord. Chuck Swindle tells a story of a time when he was visiting a veteran's home. The, um, the man that was visiting had suffered a series of heart attacks and undergone major surgery. And at this time, he couldn't have any visitors. And one of the visitors that wanted to see him really bad was his child. But while he was there, there during that time, they gave him some materials to work on, part of his therapy, and part of it was because he wanted to give something to his son. He built a, he built a truck, a wooden truck for his son. But the boy was not allowed to go into the war to visit his father. And so one day when the son came, an orderly brought the gift down to the child who was waiting in front of the hospital with his mom. And while all this is going on, the father is way up there on the fifth floor looking down at the exchange that's about to go on between the orderly, the mother, and the son. The little boy opened the package, his eyes got wide as he saw the wonderful little truck, and he hugged it to his chest. Meanwhile, his father was walking back and forth, waving his arms, trying to get his son's attention. The little boy put the truck down and reached up and hugged the orderly. Thanked him for the truck. All the while, the frustrated father was going through these dramatic gestures trying to say, it's me, son. It's me. I gave you the gift. I made that for you. Look up here. Chuck said, I can almost read his lips. Then finally the mother and the orderly turned the boy's attention up to the fifth floor window. It was then the boy cried, Daddy, oh, thank you. I miss you, Daddy. Come home, Daddy. Thank you for my truck. And the father stood in the window with tears pouring down his face. How much are we like that child? We're shut away in a cave of despair and loneliness, and then God brings along the gifts of rest and refreshment and wise counsel and close personal friends, and we fall in love with the gift rather than the giver. And he's up there all the time saying, look at me. I'm ready to pull you through. Look to me. Quit looking at everything else. I want to help you. So this morning, Elijah reminds us to look up. Look up after the Lord graciously delivers us from our depression. Let's look up when he allows us rest and refreshment and following an exhausting schedule that has taken its toll on us. Look up and thank him when he gently and patiently speaks to us from his word after we've climbed out of the pit of self-pity. Look up and praise him when he faithfully provides the companionship and affirmation of a friend who understands and encourages us. Let's look up and acknowledge the giver more than the gift. Let's say thank you, Lord, for telling us about Elijah. He was an unforgettable example of there's nowhere to look but up. Let's all look up for our redemption and our salvation and our joy. It's just one prayer away. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you that you're the God, that the giver of all things. And Father, help us to point our attention on you. Father, my prayer this morning, if there are those that are going through times of depression or, or just uh, to just give them the strength to pull through this, that they'll you know, get their eyes on you and know that you'll pull all of us through. It take a while. It may take some work. It may take some changes in our lifestyle, but you'll pull us through. Father, 
that's my prayer that we'll all, after the great joy that we felt this past week, maybe some things have just been difficult this week. And I just pray you would restore the joy to our salvation to everyone. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is hymn number 478, In His Presence. If you'd like to talk to God, this is the time to do that. If you'd like to pray before Him at the altar, this is the time to do that. If you need to talk to someone, this is the time to do that. So let me encourage you to respond as God leads you to stand and sing. Number 478.